Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 67. It's about World War I then, what was happening a hundred years ago this week, and it's about World War I now, news and updates about the centennial and the commemoration. This week, our guests include Mike Schuster from the Great War Project blog, who updates us on what the UK forces are up against, both on the front and in recruiting. Dr. Edward Lengel with the story of the U.S. Yankee Division as they enter serious battle. Kenneth Clark and Michael Robbins introduce a pictorial book, a perfect souvenir of the centennial from the Pritzker Military Museum and Library and the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. Dr. Ian Isherwood shares his experience in creating a World War I educational program structured around a soldier's letters. Dr. Alice Catherine Carls, the project instigator for the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project from Jackson, Tennessee, and the local research that it spawned. Catherine Akey keeps us in Tennessee with a social media post about a great commemoration event. All this and more on World War I Centennial News, a weekly podcast brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. Just one year after the declaration of war a hundred years ago, it's time for the third Liberty Loan Drive to raise money to pay for the war effort. Let me put the Liberty Loan Drive into perspective for you. In early 20th century thinking, Woodrow Wilson's government was completely clear that the war would be financed by money raised specifically for it, and that a majority of that money was to come from ordinary American citizens. By contrast, today in our late 20th, early 21st century, Money for our wars and military expenditures are financed from a big, boiling cauldron called the national debt. Today, the average citizen feels little or no real connection with or responsibility for our military expenditures. Not so in 1917 and 1918. In those two years, during the four bond drives, 20 million individuals purchased Liberty War bonds. Now, 20 million investors is a pretty impressive number, given the fact that there were only 24 million households in America at the time. More than $17 billion are raised. In addition, taxes are collected to the sum of $8.8 billion. In short, $26 billion is gathered to finance the fight for World War I. Now that's in 1918 dollars. Today, That equates to nearly one half a trillion dollars raised in bonds, largely from citizens and specifically for a purpose. Now, with that as a background, let's jump into our centennial time machine and take a look at the national fundraising effort and a whole lot more 100 years ago this week in the war that changed the world. On April 6, 1918, President Wilson makes a speech to launch the third Liberty Bond campaign. Here is his declaration as reported in the pages of the official bulletin, the government's war gazette, published by Wilson's propaganda chief, George Creel. Dateline, Saturday, April 6, 1918. The headline reads... The President delivers the following address at Baltimore tonight on the occasion of the opening of the Third Liberty Loan Campaign. My fellow citizens, this is the anniversary of our acceptance of Germany's challenge to fight for our right to live and be free and for the sacred right of free men everywhere. The nation is awake. There is no need to call to it. We know what the war must cost. Our utmost sacrifice, the lives of our fittest men, and if need be, all that we possess. The loan that we are met to discuss is one of the least parts of what we are called upon to give and to do, though in itself imperative. 
The people of the whole country are alive to the necessity of it and are ready to lend to the utmost, even where it involves a sharp skimping and daily sacrifice to lend out of meager earnings. They will look with reprobation and contempt upon those who can and will not, upon those who demand a higher rate of interest, upon those who think of it as a mere commercial transaction. I have not come, therefore, to urge the loan. I have come only to give you, if I can, a more vivid conception of what it is for. The president goes on to explain the situation on the ground in Europe and the dire need for America as a nation to take a stand, take a lead, and defend all that the nation holds dear. And so kicks off the third Liberty Bond campaign. A few days later, the official bulletin reports on the cabinet's Liberty Bond appeal. Dateline, Tuesday, April 9, 1918. The headline reads, Cabinet members appeal to all true Americans to support with their dollars our gallant fighters in the field. Buy Liberty Bonds, they ask, in proof of your patriotism. The article goes on with a number of cabinet members presenting their appeal of the importance and the patriotic imperative for buying bonds. But my favorite part comes at the end of the full-page article with a subheadline of What Liberty Bonds Will Buy. And the article reads... $18,000 invested in Liberty Bonds will equip an infantry battalion with rifles. $50,000 will construct a base hospital with 500 beds or equip an infantry brigade with pistols. $100,000 will buy five combat airplanes or pistols, rifles, and a half a million rounds of ammunition for an infantry regiment. Just like today, contributors to a cause want to know exactly what their contribution is buying. These guys really knew what they were doing. In another smart move, presumably pulled off by George Creel, the campaign cleverly recruits four of the most popular movie stars of the day and puts them on the road to help raise the money. The headline reads, Liberty Loans Speaking Tour for Four Motion Picture Stars. And the story opens with, Today, we're announcing the itineraries of Charles Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, and Marguerite Clark for their speaking tour during the forthcoming Liberty Loan campaign. And the article continues with a schedule of their appearances across the country. Then, on Saturday, April 13, 1918, just a week after launching the campaign, the headline in the official bulletin reads... Total sales of Liberty Bonds as reported to the Treasury pass the half a billion dollar mark as scores of towns exceed quotas. It's a big week on the home front, raising money a hundred years ago for America's participation in a war that changed the world. And it's also a big week on the fighting front. A hundred years ago this week, the 369th U.S. Infantry Regiment goes to the front lines to fight but with the French. On April 8, 1918, the 369th is amalgamated into the French army. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't General Pershing insist on keeping the American expeditionary forces together as a distinct American fighting force? Well, yeah, he did. But Pershing's insistence on keeping all the American forces together didn't extend to the black troops in the segregated U.S. Army. Among them, were the 15th New York National Guard Regiment, redesignated the 369th Infantry Regiment, but better known as the Harlem Rattlers or the Harlem Hellfighters. Now, Pershing presumably didn't have any problems with black soldiers per se, but the question of how to use black troops in the front lines, where they'd have to rely on the full cooperation of white units on either side, was a really gnarly problem. The online blog Today in World War I posted a quote from Hamilton Fish, a New Yorker, who served as one of the regiment's white officers. Quote, The French were crying out for the U.S. regiments to go into the French army. So I guess Pershing figured that he could kill two birds with one stone, solve the problem on what to do with us, and give something to Foch. From then on, we spent our entire service in the French army. Uh, officially, we were still the 369th U.S. Infantry, but for all intents and purposes, we were Francais. The Post goes on to quote from Noble Cecil, who served in the regiment's famous band. 
We were fully equipped with French rifles and French helmets. Our wagons, our rations, our machine guns, and everything pertaining to our equipment of the regiment for the trench warfare was supplied by the French army. The 369th went on to serve with great distinction, spending more time on the front line than any other U.S. forces, with a fierceness and bravery that never gave ground to the enemy. A proud combat service that started a hundred years ago this week in the war that changed the world. Continuing to explore the story on the front, we're going to go to Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and curator for the Great War Project blog. Mike, your post this week speaks to what can only be thought of as a moment of total desperation for the British lines. It's just been exactly two years since they brutally put down Ireland's Easter uprising. Now they're trying to conscript the Irish. And they're not having much luck drafting more Canadians either. General Haig puts out his inspirational backs to the wall order. And at this very moment of do or die, well, your story this week closes with a note of hope. Fill it in for us, Mike. Sure, Theo. The headline reads, Allies face resistance in own ranks. Germans renew onslaught. Irish Canadians defy England. Finally, the Americans. This is special to the Great War Project. On this day a century ago, the Germans renew their offensive on the Western Front ferociously. After a bombardment lasting four and a half hours, reports historian Martin Gilbert, the Battle of the Lys began. 14 German divisions attacked on a 10-mile front. The British were driven back. So too was a Portuguese division, against which the Germans sent four divisions, taking 6,000 Portuguese prisoners and creating a gap three and a half miles wide in the British line. Reports Gilbert, so fierce was the initial German artillery bombardment that one Portuguese battalion refused to go forward into its trenches. Further havoc was caused when 2,000 tons of mustard gas Phosgene and other chemicals were discharged against the British forces, incapacitating 8,000 men. The British situation was so grave, Gilbert writes, that on April 9th, a century ago, conscription was extended to Ireland, a measure hitherto avoided because it was so bitterly opposed by the Irish nationalists. The poet William Butler Yeats writes in protest, I read in the newspaper yesterday that over 300,000 Irish soldiers have landed in France in a month, And it seems to me a strangely wanton thing that England, for the sake of 50,000 Irish soldiers, is prepared to hollow another trench between England and Ireland and fill it with blood. If conscription were imposed on Ireland, Yeats writes, women and children will stand in front of their men and receive the bullets rather than let them be taken to the front. There is similar resistance to conscription in Canada. There, the anti-war feeling that had led so many men to resist enlistment at the end of 1917 re-emerges. Hundreds are ordered to report for enlistment in Quebec. Hundreds decline. By April, they are arrested, whereupon reports Gilbert, anti-conscription rioters ransacked and burned the building containing the military service registration office. They then fired on troops who had been sent to disperse them. According to a newspaper account, The mob used rifles, revolvers, and bricks. The military found it necessary to use a machine gun before the mob was overcome. Four civilians were killed. Gilbert reports, to calm the situation, the Canadian government ordered a suspension in the arrest of army deserters. Back on the battlefield for six days, the Allies struggled to defend successive lines of German soldiers. On April 11th, the British Supreme Commander, General Sir Douglas Haig, issues special order of the day. There is no course open to us but to fight it out, he declares. Every position must be held to the last man. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight to the end. And then this from British nurse Vera Britton, assigned to a hospital near the front. She is leaving her sleeping quarters when she has to step off the road and let a large contingent of Allied soldiers pass. An unusual quality of bold vigor in their stride, she reports caused me to stare at them with puzzled interest. They looked larger than ordinary men. Their tall, straight figures were in vivid contrast to the undersized armies of pale recruits to which we were grown accustomed. Then she hears an excited cry from the nurses nearby. Look, look, here are the Americans. And that's the news this week from The Great War Project. Thank you, Mike. Mike Schuster from The Great War Project blog.
And one last story from the front. For our segment, America Emerges, Military Stories from World War I with Dr. Edward Langle. As Mike indicated, this is the time when the American infantry does arrive on the front. The boys are fresh, healthy, and eager when compared to their battle-weary allies. They're also green. The Germans want to, or maybe they even need to, discredit them. The school of combat is now in session for the Americans, and the lessons begin a hundred years ago this week in Seychelles. Lessons for all sides, and Ed's here to tell you the story. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke about the 26th Yankee Division entering the front lines and encountering a curious tribe of useful rats in the trenches who helped to protect them from poison gas. At the end of March, the Yankee Division moves into the lines, taking over a sector near Ansovi, France, that had been occupied by the 1st Division, the Big Red One. This is a terrible sector. It's a low-lying ground, it's swampy, it's flooded, and the Germans hold complete command of observation over the sector. They have positions on a nearby hill where they can see everything that's happening. And as a result, they're pummeling the Yankee division from the very beginning with artillery and poison gas and machine gun fire. On April 10th and 12th, German infantry assault positions held by the American 104th Regiment of the 26th Yankee division. The Doughboys firmly hold their ground. They drive the enemy back with the help of machine guns and artillery, but it's going to get a lot more difficult. Part of the Yankee division's line circles the wrecked little village of Seshpre. And this sector is occupied by the 102nd Regiment, which is commanded by a gentleman named Colonel John H. Machine Gun Parker, who had commanded a Gatling gun detachment in the Spanish-American War and is still known by this name. Some people doubt his sanity. There's an episode shortly before the troops move into the front lines where Parker is reviewing his men and he drives by in a staff car and he orders them to fire their machine guns over his head as he's driving by. And then when the, the machine gun fire ceases, he leaps out of his car and yells to them, I've brought you over here to get killed and that's what I'm going to do. So you can imagine their thoughts as they're occupying the front lines under Colonel Parker. Uh, this is a difficult position as a salient. It's vulnerable to attack by the enemy. Parker is worried about it. The divisional commander, Clarence Edwards, is worried about it. But they don't have time to make any changes before on the cold and misty morning of April 20th at 3 a.m., German artillery began to fire a heavy barrage on the American infantry around Seshpre. And two hours later at dawn, bombardment turns into a box barrage that cuts off the Americans from reinforcements or from communications. And simultaneously, 1,000 highly trained German stormtroopers move forward through the mist. One of the German soldiers had remarked to a comrade, those chaps from the other side of the big pond should learn about real war. And that's what they were about to do. The Germans are ruthlessly efficient. They penetrate the 102nd Regiment's lines at two points and then meet in the rear at Seshpre. But if they expected the Americans to give up easily, they would be sorely mistaken because the Americans fight hard along the front and in the rear in Seshpre, American headquarters troops, including clerks and other rear area men, pick up their rifles and fight the Germans hand to hand. And in the front lines, Americans set up machine guns uh, and move quickly to try to block the penetration. Unfortunately, the penetration has moved too quickly for the Americans to completely deflect it, and they take heavy losses. As the American generals are trying to figure out what's going on, General Clarence Edwards calls the brigade commander, General Peter Traub, to find out what's happening. And to add insult to injury, as they're talking on the phone, two mischievous German soldiers have cut into the line and they interrupt and laugh wildly and they say they're two crooks and they're in the game and then they cut the line. When it's all over, the Germans have killed or wounded about 300 Yankee Division doughboys, and they've captured five officers and 178 men and two machine guns. The Germans have taken heavy losses, too. We don't know exactly how many casualties they took, but it's certainly in the dozens because the Americans did fight hard. 
after this battle is over, there's a blame game that takes place. General Edwards of the Yankee division claims that he had inflicted a severe defeat on the Germans, that his losses were not as severe as some people claimed, but Pershing blames this on Edwards, and this will very quickly become a vendetta and a difficult problem in the American command. But it's a wake-up call for the American forces and an opportunity for them to learn a little bit of what 20th century warfare is going to be like as they move very quickly into a period of heavy combat in the spring of 1918. Dr. Edward Langle is an American military historian, author, and our segment host for America Emerges, Military Stories from World War I. There are links in the podcast notes to Ed's post and his website as an author. For videos about World War I 100 years ago this week, check out our friends at the Great War Channel on YouTube. Their new episodes this week include... Operation Michael Runs Out of Breath, and France Before World War I, La Belle Époque. See their videos by searching for The Great War on YouTube or by following our link in the podcast notes. Okay, it's time to fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. This part of the broadcast focuses on now and how we're commemorating the centennial of World War I. We have an update for our segment, A Century in the Making, America's World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. As our regular listeners know, we're building a national World War I Memorial at Pershing Park in the nation's capital. It's a big project and it's been a long time coming. We spoke with sculptor Sabin Howard back in episodes 54 and 55 about a new process. Sabin combined advanced 3D printing technology at the Weta Workshop in New Zealand with traditional classic sculpture techniques to create a 10-foot miniature draft of the sculptural centerpiece for the memorial. The result is called a maquette. We made two of them to show America and to help us raise money for this strictly publicly funded memorial project. One maquette was on display at the Visitor Center in the Tennessee Bicentennial Mall in downtown Nashville, right in front of the state capitol. It was quite a hit at the Tennessee Great War Commission's event last Saturday, where it was featured as part of the presentation from Terry Hamby, the World War I Centennial Commission chairman. Both maquettes are being prepped for a busy schedule of showings at special events and fundraisers around the country. We'll keep you updated as the schedules evolve. So, Catherine... You went to a fundraiser on Wednesday and got your first look at the sculpture that's called A Soldier's Journey. What was your reaction? I think the thing I was most surprised by, I mean, number one, it's really beautiful, but I was really amazed at the amount of detail, even at that size, even way, way, way smaller than the final piece will end up being. Little things like the the texture of the cloth making up the men's puttees, or there's one section where one of the soldiers has just lifted his foot out of the mud and you can see the footprint in the mud and it's got the right nails in the footprint that would have been in the soles of the boots that they were wearing at the time. Um, it's, it's very impressive and it's gonna be really amazing to see it when all the figures are essentially life-size just because of the the amount of detail that he was able to to incorporate. Did you pick up any comments from any other people as they were getting their first look at it? Yeah, similar to, to me, just sort of like, wow, this is so much more detailed. I think being 20th and 21st century individuals, we're kind of used to sculptures that are not in the sort of Renaissance tradition. Um, And it's really nice to see people's response to that kind of technique, to a classical sculptural technique, something that incorporates a lot of mimesis, a lot of detail, um, and see them really appreciate that. I think you just made Saban very happy. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. He deserves it. He did a really good job. It looks great. Well, thank you, Catherine. Learn more about the memorial and follow the incredible journey of a project that's been a century in the making. Go to www.cc.org slash memorial or follow the link in the podcast notes. 
And while we're speaking about the memorial, we have a brand new way for you to help build America's World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. And at the same time, get yourself a very special, colorful, inspiring, and lasting souvenir of the centennial. This week marks the release of a new visual pictorial table book called Lest We Forget the Great War. The book is dedicated to the centennial and produced by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, along with the World War I Centennial Commission. And when you get this visual remembrance, a full one half of the proceeds go to building the memorial. With us to tell us more about Lest We Forget, which also has a companion exhibit in Chicago at the Pritzker, are Kenneth Clark, former president and CEO of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and Michael Robbins, historian. Ken was the executive and creative director for the book and exhibition, and Michael was the writer for the text. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Yeah, glad to be here. Hey, Ken, let me start with you. Lest We Forget is a book and a companion exhibition. Can you give us an overview? What's the concept? Sure. Uh, There are two things that are supposed to go together and yet stand completely independently. About 20% of the content is shared between either the book or the exhibit in downtown Chicago. Lest we forget the book is a poster, photograph, and textbook that is supposed to give anybody who wants to learn about World War I a image-rich, wonderful dive into the history of World War I without overwhelming them with all the information that is available on the war. The exhibit in Chicago focuses on the Doughboy experience and the sailor experience. It goes from artifacts from the USS Olympia sailors to uh, the soldiers as they went through the various battles. And then it goes into an exploration of the American cemeteries in France, where many of the men who died in France and elsewhere are buried from World War I. Well, Ken, there's nearly 350 images in this book. I mean, there's posters and photographs. How did you select them? Well, for the posters, we acquired many, many, a thousand plus World War I posters. We went through a very interesting process of getting those all cataloged and scanned. I sent the posters over to Michael and uh, Wendy Palitz, who is my fellow creative director for this book. From those 300, we winnowed it down to about 166. The images, unlike the posters, the posters don't tell a story of World War I because posters are not chronological. They're propaganda pieces, more or less. The images in the book go with the text that Michael Robbins wrote. Those really give you a photographic image of what was happening during the war. So you kind of have this interesting art book that has a history of the war that is also illustrated. Well, that's a good segue over to you, Michael. Uh, Now, you're the writer on the project. Uh, What story are you telling and how do the words interact with the pictures? Well, as Ken pointed out, the words and the pictures more or less go together in a general chronology of the developments in the war, while the posters stand somewhat apart as propaganda commentary on the nature of the war. And I think the best summary of the role of the posters was delivered by Hugh Strawn, eminent professor of military history. And his point about the posters are that they really tell in an emotional way, in a very economic way what the war was about and why both sides, the Central Powers and the Allies, were actually fighting. So the posters are a special kind of emotional commentary. The story of the text is primarily a chronology. There are chapters on each individual year of the war, but also it has an underlying theme, and I think the underlying theme is the importance of World War I, not just as a world war, but as a world-changing war with long-lasting results that we can see even today. Well, you know, we like to call it and and refer to it often as the war that changed the world. Now, a question to both of you. What were some of the hardest challenges in pulling this all together? So I think the biggest challenge was really coordinating a well-balanced book that also made sure that we were getting the right mix of posters so that you would have the ability to tell a little bit of that story that Michael just referred to, that Hugh Strom was talking about, that emotional aspect of the war. I think everyone who undertakes to, uh, uh, with a great deal of humility, to tell the story of World War I in one medium or another quickly comes to realize that this is such a vast event that the real challenge is deciding what not to tell and what not to include. 
That makes a great deal of sense. You know, we, we have a saying, when you're throwing out great stuff, you're in good shape. And <laughs> that was the giant challenge of this. Yes, I think that's true here. Michael and I and Wendy had a lot of fun with this particular one as far as discovery and, and also having an aha moment that was important to us the quote-unquote discovery of the free core posters in the museum and libraries collection. We knew we had them, but just making sure they got into the book because these are the propaganda posters that were the militias that formed immediately following World War I in Germany that were considered the precursor of the Nazis. There was a very high percentage of the German people in the German military who did not believe that they'd been defeated, even though they clearly had been. So they were reluctant to give up the kinds of things that they had to give up under the provisions of the Versailles Treaty. They formed quasi-military organizations that were highly disruptive of civil society in Germany at the time. So, so uh, real quickly, Ken, what, one last question I wanted to ask you. Who is this book actually aimed at? Who is it for? Is it for enthusiasts, historians, or who is the book for? Well, there's a saying out there is the people who know the least, want to know the most. What I really wanted to accomplish with this book is create a book for somebody who isn't an expert on World War I or even military history. Tell a accessible, good story about World War I so that people can understand what Michael said and what the World War I Centennial Commission says, that this war changed the world and we're living in its aftermath right now. So that was the goal. The goal is everybody. And I know that that's a hard thing to get, but I think we got close. The book is available in bookstores nationwide, but the easiest place to get it is in the commission's merchandise shop. Look under commemorate at www.1cc.org. And we also have the link to the commission's shop in the podcast notes. Gentlemen, thank you both for coming on to the podcast and introducing us to this beautiful must-get souvenir of the centennial. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kenneth Clark and Michael Robbins, the creative director and writer for Lest We Forget, The Great War. Now for our education segment, we have a story of a teacher and his approach to teaching World War I. Collections of soldiers' letters and diaries from the war continued to be discovered and rediscovered a hundred years after they were first written. And as we've learned from a number of museum curators, they offer an amazing opportunity to help understand this event in history as they bring in the first-person point of view. Today, we're joined by Dr. Ian Isherwood, visiting assistant professor at Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, who's doing exactly that. Welcome, Dr. Isherwood. Thanks for having me on. So, Dr. Isherwood, you've been using wartime letters from Lieutenant Colonel Jack Pierce, a British soldier, as the foundation for teaching history to your students. For context, can you tell us briefly about the soldier and how you came across his letters? Sure. Lieutenant Colonel Jack Pierce was an officer in the British Army from 1914 until 1919, and he served with distinction in the 8th Queen's Regiment, which is from West Surrey in England. He rose in rank from lieutenant to lieutenant colonel, and he was repeatedly decorated for valor on the Western Front. He was very much a model officer, and he fought a very, very hard war for three years of service. The letters came to me and came to the college through his family and through one of my students. A student came up to me after class one day, Marco Dracopoli, and he told me that he had a collection of his great-grandfather's letters from World War I. When Marco brought them in, a very large box that was full of this material, I realized that this was an extensive collection of over 300 letters plus ephemera from an officer that was in command and very much learning how to command over three years of active war. Marco went on to use this material for a very good paper called A New Officer for a New Army. But then after he graduated, I got together with his family and with our college archivist. We sat down and we thought about the uses for the collection beyond traditional archival use for it. We we came up with an idea to create a digital history project where we would release the letters 100 years to the day in which Piers wrote them. And we would set up an Instagram account and a Twitter account from Jack Piers and a Facebook page so that we would be able to tell the story of this officer, but also his men and the transformation of war on the Western Front as kind of a commemorative project over the next three years. And so that's what we've been doing with the Piers Project. 
Well, the audience for this show is definitely the right audience to tell about this. They love these kinds of things. Now, at the commission, we're really interested in techniques for teaching the subject. What advice would you give to others who may want to undertake an educational program like this? Well, I'd say a few things. One is to not be scared to go outside of your comfort zone and use technology and to also not be scared by kind of the burden of expertise. We involve students, our student research assistants, who are really the backbone of the project. We've actually put together a really good team. So I'd say that my advice is to kind of just do it and to experiment as you're going along the way. That's sage advice. Now, do you think this might work uh, for a younger audience of of students rather than uh, university? Yes, I think definitely. I think that for students in high school or in junior high, a project like this is a great opportunity to teach historical methods early, where you bring sources in, you have students learn basic questions for source evaluation, you then have them work with transcribing source materials, digitizing them with annotating them, and then writing some degree of commentary on them. And that's the model that we've been working with. And our students have become better historians by working on the project. And I think that you could implement this at kind of all levels. Well, you know, we've, we've had uh, museum curators in and so forth who are publishing uh, the first person accounts. And the wonderful thing that we're, that seems to be common is that the first person point of view gives you just incredible insights that you just can't get out of facts. Did you, did you find that as well? Well, definitely. And Piers is also a very lively correspondent. Piers is gossiping from the Western Front. He's talking about entertaining his men. He's talking about transformations of leadership. And that certainly helps because it gives you a real voice of somebody that you can then build a context around. Uh, and it's not just the story of peers that we're interested in. Peers commanded a battalion of 800 men. And through peers, we're hoping to tell a bit of their story, too. And it's a very hard-fought battalion. They were involved in every major campaign of the British Army on the Western Front. They're reconstituted time and time again, suffering very, very bad casualties. But they endure and they fight through the rest of the war. Now, you're personally working on a new and upcoming book. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So my previous book, which is entitled Remembering the Great War, was a study of soldier memoirs written in Britain during the interwar period, the 1920s and 1930s. When I looked at the peers material, I kind of realized that there's a book opportunity here. I haven't found a publisher yet for it, but the book as I've designed it is about the life and death of a battalion of infantry on the Western Front, how they become hardened soldiers by the end of the war. So I'm hoping to take kind of the idea of like a traditional regimental history and, and turn it on its head a little bit. Well, Dr. Isherwood, thank you for coming in and giving us the insights and some really good ideas about how education for the subject can be dealt with. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. Dr. Ian Isherwood is a visiting assistant professor and the chairperson of the Civil War Era Studies at Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We put links for his Jack Pierce website and Twitter accounts in the podcast notes. And now let's head into our weekly feature, Speaking World War I, where we explore the words and the phrases that are rooted in the war. It's a health fad pretty much anyone can benefit from. It's very popular. It's very hip. And I'll bet you had no idea it's from World War I. And no, it's not Zumba. No, it's not kickboxing, and no, it's definitely not P90X. It's our speaking World War I word for this week, Pilates. Pilates is named for its inventor, Joseph Hubertus Pilates, who created it in Great Britain during World War I. Pilates, interestingly, was born a German citizen. He was a frail and sickly kid who exercised for both his health and self-defense against bullies. He eventually grew into an accomplished boxer and a martial artist and traveled to England in 1912 to find work, picking up a job as a circus performer. But when the war broke out, he was arrested as an enemy alien and interned on the Isle of Man. It was there that he came up with his method of mental and physical exertion, which he called contrology and it was a way to encourage his fellow inmates to stay healthy. Many of the prisoners there were bedridden, and so Pilates invented a makeshift resistance training machine out of the springs and straps taken from the beds and attached to the foot and the headboards. Now, this use of resistance loads would later become a staple of the Pilates method. 
After World War I ended, Pilates immigrated to the United States and settled in New York, where he and his wife Clara founded the first body contrology studio in 1925. And of course, that was the foundation for the trendy new exercise method known far and wide as Pilates. Pilates, created by a German citizen prisoner in wartime. And this week's word for speaking World War I. You'll find more information by following the link in the podcast notes. This week for our 100 Cities 100 Memorial segment, the $200,000 matching grant challenge to rescue and focus on our local World War I memorials, it looks like this week is Tennessee week all over because we're going to be profiling the World War I Memorial Fountain Project from Madison County in Jackson, Tennessee. With us to tell us about the project is Dr. Alice Catherine Carls, the Tom Elam Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Tennessee at Martin and a member of the Tennessee Great War Commission. Welcome, Dr. Carls. Thank you for having me. Dr. Carls, your World War I memorial honors both the women on the home front in Tennessee and the men on the fighting front in France. That's a really interesting approach. Could you tell us more about it? The fountain itself has two plaques, one that is dedicated to the surgical dressings workers of Madison County, and the other that is honoring the men in Madison County who died in the war. And so that is what I have been researching to learn more about the history of the fountain and the history of the men and women in the war. And I think because the fountain was created that way back at the end of World War I, this uh, tells something about the city of Jackson. It's very unique for a World War I memorial to honor both the home front and the war front. Exactly. The very unusual Jackson is uh, located in West Tennessee, and it was actually the center of very lively and active chapter of the American Red Cross. And it was all due to the work of uh, Dr. James McLaren, a local physician who went to the French Front in 1915 and came back to Jackson with the knowledge of a new form of dressing that was much more adapted to the grievous wounds suffered by the soldiers as a result of heavy artillery bombardment. And so the first thing that he did when the United States entered the war is to send Mrs. Dudley, a local woman, to New York to learn how to make surgical dressings. And then she came back, founded a local chapter of the American Red Cross very early with other local women. These ladies started sewing surgical dressings right there in June 1917. It's absolutely amazing. And what is even more amazing is that the ladies were learning to sew in classes that were held at this home. And the third class of women who learned to sew those dressings was a class of all African-American women. And I think this is very, very unusual also. Fascinating. Yeah. And if we go a little bit deeper in that direction, not all the women who participated in the sewing effort and not all the men who died in the war are listed on the fountain. And this really is an interesting piece of historical evidence because the fountain in 1919 was segregated Names of African-American soldiers who died from Madison County are not on the original plaque. Also, how about this entire class of African-American women? In its report, the local chapter indicated that uh, this was the only such case in the entire United States of having an entire group of African-American women who learned to sew surgical dressings. And so here we have an opportunity to put something online and to leave a document in the Jackson Madison County Public Library. It's more than just restoring a memorial fountain. It is writing the entire history behind it. I think that's a lovely statement. You know, one of the reasons we did the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials program was to stimulate and have communities rediscover their heritage. And for your project, you've been promoting it locally. How's the community response been? Well, this is very interesting. Everybody I talk to is really very excited about this project. The city commission to the local archivists, historians, the mayor, and different people. You know, when I mention the fountain, they say, oh, yeah, I used to drink from that fountain. I remember it well. Oh, it is a World War One fountain? You're kidding. <laughs> that's, not, that's not uncommon at all. No. no. So we're rediscovering a very important piece of Jackson's history. 
Well, the memorial, is, as you mentioned, was designed as a fountain, but it's been dry for a long time. In your grant application, you hadn't quite decided whether you're going to get the fountain replumbed. Uh, that's kind of a major undertaking. It's pretty tricky. Are you going to do it? Well, actually, two days ago, the fountain was lifted from its foundation and the restoration work has begun. And we could see that inside it's all hollow and it'd be very easy to fit pipes, but it will not be replumbed. Uh, so uh, do you have any rededication plans for this year? November 11, 2018, we're preparing a rather elaborate rededication of the fountain. Uh, Dr. Carls, thank you for leading the project on behalf of your community and on behalf of the men and the women of your county who served uh, here and abroad in World War I. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been an honor and a privilege. Dr. Alice Catherine Carls, professor of history at the University of Tennessee and a member of the Tennessee Great War Commission. Learn more about the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials program and about West Tennessee and World War I by following the links in the podcast notes or by going to www.cc.org slash 100 Memorials. This week, for World War I War Tech, another technology that saved lives instead of taking them. In the early months of the war, amputations for wounded soldiers were at the same high level as those of the Civil War. In other words, very high. By late 1915, that rate dropped dramatically. So what happened? Well, that year, a French physician... Théodore Tuffier testified to the Academy of Medicine that 70% of amputations weren't because of the initial injury, but because of later infections. As we've talked about on the podcast before, the mud-filled, deeply unsanitary conditions of trench warfare were a happy home for bacteria that caused gangrene. The antiseptics of the 19th century were just basically inadequate. But two men, French doctor Alexis Carrel and British biochemist Henry Dakin came together under the cloud of war to combine their two discoveries to create one very effective method of disinfecting wounds. Dakin created a solution of sodium hypochlorite that managed to kill any bacteria in the wound but didn't damage the flesh surrounding it. Meanwhile, Dr. Carrel developed a strategy of opening and thoroughly draining the wounds. Put together, the corell dakin method proved the most effective antiseptic treatment to date. The procedure quickly spread into use all across Europe, saving untold numbers of limbs from amputation. The corell dakin method, an incredible leap forward in the treatment of field wounds, and the subject of this week's World War I war tech. We've put links in the podcast notes to learn more, including a link to the Commission's website on medicine at www.cc.org slash medicine, all lowercase. For articles and posts, we're going to continue with the idea we launched last week of highlighting the features of the weekly dispatch newsletter. So here we go. Headline. Final 50 World War I memorials announced in wrap-up of competition phase of 100 cities, 100 memorials. In the article, you'll also learn about the Memorial Hunters Club, a crowdsourced effort to create a comprehensive national register of World War I memorials. Headline. The film needed really brilliant, nuanced, convincing performances. The interview from this podcast with director Saul Dibb about the motion picture A Journey's End, now in wide release, has been turned into a print article on the website. Headline. It was a sad but poignant tale. Two lifelong friends, now octogenarians, have produced a documentary film about one of their uncle's service in World War I. Headline, Pennsylvania Oil and World War I. Remember how important coal was during World War I? Well, supplement that knowledge by reading about the role of Pennsylvania oil during the war. Headline, Over here in Michigan, high school athletes gave to the World War I effort. Michigan's high school athletes helped fill the labor shortage created as millions of men shipped out overseas. Headline, Break of Day, Poet Isaac Rosenberg. The Wright blog features the World War I poetry of British soldier Isaac Rosenberg, who died on Easter Sunday, 1918, and who was also mentioned by Mike Schuster in last week's podcast. 
Headline, The Story of Donald Chapman. This week's featured story of service submitted by his grandniece, Tish Wells. Finally, this week's selection from our official online Centennial merchandise store. An authentic, classic green U.S. woolen army blanket from Woolrich, Inc., the oldest continuously operating woolen mill in the U.S. and supplier of army blankets a hundred years ago. Sign up for the weekly dispatch newsletter at www.cc.org slash subscribe and check the archives at www.cc.org slash dispatch or follow the link in the podcast notes. And that brings us to The Buzz, the centennial of World War I this week in social media with Catherine Akey. Hey, Teo. As we commemorate 101 years since first joining the World War, incredible events are beginning to take place across the country to remember those who served. Over the last weekend, Tennessee held a massive living history event in Nashville, the very event that the maquette recently appeared at. The Tennessee State Park System hosted the event, which included reproduction trenches, encampments, and field kitchens, as well as World War I-era aircraft and many reenactors including suffragettes and Salvation Army donut lassies handing out freshly made treats. There was also a large group of reenactors representing the African-American troops of Tennessee, wearing the iconic French Adrian helmet that was distributed to the troops amalgamated with French units. And the whole weekend was capped off with a period baseball game. We shared an article this week on Facebook, as well as an album of photos from the event. You can find links to those in the podcast notes. Lastly, for this week, we shared an article that instigated some spirited debate on our Facebook page, a list of what the author of the article considers 13 essential books on the American Expeditionary Forces. The list is a great starting place for anyone wanting to delve deeper into this chapter of American history, but be sure to check the link to the Facebook post itself to see all the recommendations made by our community. There were many of them. That's it this week for The Buzz. And that's the second week of April for World War I Centennial News. Thank you for listening. We also want to thank our guests, Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog, Dr. Edward Lengel, military historian and author, Ken Clark and Michael Robbins, creative director and writer for the new souvenir of the Centennial book, Lest We Forget, Dr. Ian Isherwood, historian and World War I educator, Dr. Alice Catherine Carls, World War I researcher and member of the Tennessee Great War Commission. Catherine Akey, World War I photography specialist and the line producer for the podcast. Many thanks to the newest member of our team, Mac Nelson, our intrepid sound editor. A shout out to our intern, John Morreale, for his great research assistance. And I'm Teo Mayer, your host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago into today's classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation, for their support. The podcast can be found on our website at www.cc.org. Or search for WW1 Centennial News on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Podbean, Stitcher, Radio On Demand, Spotify, or use your smart speaker. Just say, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. Our Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC and we're on Facebook at WW1Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. I'm over here, you're over there, and every Troubles and care. Oh.
Welcome to Beverly Hills Pilates, the latest and trendiest in exercise. No, it's not. It's from World War I. So long. <laughs> <laughs>